Hello, everybody. I guess some people are joining in. Um, welcome to the stream. <laughs> Tell me how you can hear me, those that are here. Good evening. Yes. Uh, all good? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So I will start today's stream. <laughs> with, uh, I guess we will just wait a couple minutes to see that people will join. Those of you who are here. Meanwhile, I um, invite you to start writing your questions and I will try to answer them. How are things are? Yeah. Um, things are really hot in Texas where I am. Somebody was asking me, uh, oh, hello, Leonardo from Bolivia. Yes, <laughs> nice to have you here. Um, in, in Tunisia, oh my goodness, I am looking at people who are joining. That's really wonderful. Very different countries, far away. Um, so in Texas, meanwhile, where I am and I live, somebody was asking me if I live in Vermont. No, I don't live in Vermont, but I, I, I have. Uh, taught, them taught them there. there. So perhaps that's how I maybe met some people who live in Vermont. España, Canada, welcome. Ireland, very welcome. <laughs> Wonderful, it's great. So in Scotland, fantastic. <laughs> All right, so um, while people are coming in and perhaps uh, getting ready to ask questions, I will start with a um, couple answers from questions I received just to, to my videos. One of them uh, was whether one can play the Boeing Ricochet from a uh, down bow only, or can it be done also on up bow? And the answer is it can be done up bow as well. So Ricochet itself, as you know, might know, it's a it's a throw, thrown stroke when you put the bow over the string, not too far. And then the right part of the bow uh, and don't grab the fingers and just let it be on the string. So that's ricochet, right? The beginning of ricochet. The key here is that we don't move the bow too fast. So if I move, move fast, it will be like this, sounding kind of uh, not very cleanly. Uh, so a little bit bow and that's down bow but it's the same thing if i do the up bow the only difference why why we don't really do it on up bow is because even a little difference uh in the bow part uh does influence how the stroke will be bouncing so here the bow is slightly heavier so it will be bounced slower and here it will be faster so if you start from here you have to a little bit compensate by the fact that there's just enough, not enough weight of the stick at that point, and a little bit more weight down bow. So it's more comfortable overall to play it, of course, on the down bow when it is a single ricochet. But a lot of times we play ricochet down and up. And I'm showing like that because usually those are these things. When you go over the four strings. Now this is I'm trying to uh, to show really slow in slow motion, and of course right now I'm controlling it. But in a uh, fast movement, uh, it is we kind of don't control. We just slightly throw here, slightly throw there, and the bow will still bounce. So yeah, because it can be done and down and up bow equally. Okay, so another question was I'm. Uh, remembering correctly. Oh, it was a question of vibrato, and, and if you can do uh, a health production, how do you vibrato shoulder and shoulders? And so, so um, the person who asked said that they have problems in lower positions, and because they uh, co hold violin, not only so it's a collarbone, as we know, violin is always support on collarbone. Whether you play with shoulder rest or without shoulder rest, collarbone is involved, of course, right? And then um, most of us, not all, most of us also have the violin touching two fingers here, so the thumb and the inside of the index finger, okay? 
So that's usual position. Now, if you are playing with the shoulder rest, then you can sort of hang violin basically on your shoulder, it's being supported. And then uh, you can also loosen part of here, of the hold in here. However, even without, uh, without shoulder rest, so what happens here for vibrato, we have to come off slightly here. Uh, in any case, so if you're playing without shoulder rest, it's most likely that your thumb will go more underneath like this, and then you will have that space, and that will allow, allow your uh, vibrato to go. Your, well, I'm using wrist vibratos again, as you know, mostly wrist vibratos, so yes, it will be going like there. Uh, you cannot vibrate with anything, with support, without support, we cannot vibrate if we are clamping both here. Little touch, yes, but for vibrato, we always come off, even if we are playing with the shoulders. So that would be the answer. By the way, um, uh, Mr. Menuhin, Menuhin, Yigudi Menuhin, one of the greatest, greatest, greatest violinists ever uh, in the 20th century specifically, he uh, played without shoulders, of course, and he, of course, is because he was he just learned that, like, that way and it, he was proponent of this, obviously, since he did it that way. But the interesting thing about him was that he completely never touched with uh, the inside part of his uh, index finger. Never. In the, not during the route or not during anything. Um, and therefore, it's possible. He's a living proof. It's possible to play without shoulder rest, without any support, and not even touching on the in, inside of that. Um, okay. I'm looking at the questions here. Will I save this live video? Yes, uh, it will be saved. All of the streams are hanging out there uh, in the channel and I would be, I guess, on the YouTube maybe? No, probably the channel. Here are Senti, my director. He is, yeah, the video will be saved for sure. So anyway, um, that's speaking about vibrato and what happens with this with vibrato. So basically, going off that question, whether uh, whether you're using shoulder rest or you don't use shoulder rest, when you use vibrato, we always come off slightly here. Uh, we rarely, you know, you could possibly touch a little bit and go back and forth. It's not a very pleasant sensation, so we usually don't. Um, okay, so what else I can remember from the other uh, questions there well I mean, okay so i will just go to you what pieces do you recommend for college audition repertoire um and yes hello to florida and hello to other people so pieces for a college uh, audition repertoire first of all we always go to the website of the college in which you want to apply to which you want to apply okay so because there will be audition requirements uh most colleges if you're looking for a performance program uh, performance violin performance in this case you will need a movement of concerto romantic concerto so not mozart not haydn not bach but it has to be later than that uh, so it has to be romantic concerto one movement some colleges require three movements most require one movement usually first movement uh, if there is a cadenza you should prepare a cadenza uh, and at least two movements of solo bach uh, so solo Bach can be either two movements from partita or two movements from sonata. Uh, usually that's the minimum requirement. Okay? Some colleges also require, in addition, one virtuosic piece or a Paganini caprice always goes in the virtuosic piece. So um, that can be there. Uh, it can, sometimes it can be a sonata. It just can be a third piece. Many colleges require it. Most colleges, even though they require it, they will never hear it in the audition. So the audition will be the one or two movements above and uh, a concerto, the first movement of the concerto. So that is a standard, okay? But always please go to the website, see the repertoire requirements, and then start preparing. Okay, um, what book of scale studies and etudes do you recommend for a beginner? The question. Well, in... My former country, that will be the, the book by Grigorin uh, or Grigorian. The, those are the books of scales that we used. Basically, um, it's like uh, an improved Hshimali. And Hshimali, or Hshimali as it's pronounced, it's spelled H R I M A L Y, 
you know, the Khrimali, I think it's sometimes called in English, but it's Gjemali. So Gregorian is the, you know, based on Gjemali, very good skills. Now in this country, mostly I think Barber, Barber has good beginning skills as I heard. I don't teach beginners really. Um, um, uh, like every, every week, every day, whatever, sometimes I consult them, but I, I heard very good things about Barber, Barber uh, skills. Now, uh, etudes. Um, etudes at first, it should be from maybe if you use any method of uh, teaching, you know, young people that will be there. But basically, we start always with um, uh, Wolfert, Kaiser, Kaiser etudes, Wolfert etudes, and uh, just very, very rudimentary things to go really slowly. It should first be on one string. So I would look into methods at first for really beginners. Uh, and find something that is on one string and without stressing the hand too much. Okay, and then go to Kaiser and Wolford, and then Mazas and so on. Um, hello, uh, Brazil. Hello, Australia. Uh, okay, uh, let me see. Uh, about trying out violins at the string club, what to play as a beginner? Um, well, it's a good question. I mean, if you are an adult beginner, I would I would suggest that you take somebody with you who is not a beginner, that they will be trying to find a violin, and you will listen to them, okay? Um, and then once they choose something that is kind of sounds better and they already know by the ear, then you can you also will try and then see how you like the, the tone. That would be my suggestion. It's because if it's a child who's a beginner, there will always, always teach you teach the goes there. Or you take several instruments uh, for to try out. Every luthier should give you one or two or maybe sometimes even three instruments to try out, especially if you live in an area where you have the luthier shops and you can, you, you, you know, you write up something for them. Uh, they have usually a form to sign and you can take instruments for a trial. And so even if it's a beginner, I mean, I think it could be done if it's very serious business. If not, uh, then I would definitely have somebody who, who is not a beginner to try the instruments for you or for your student. Um, now, how do I know if it's a good violin when uh, that you're going to buy? Well, again, for beginners, it doesn't, forgive me, for beginners, it doesn't matter that much because beginners usually should start with the violins that are not very expensive at all. Uh, for a lot of beginners, I would suggest renting rather than buying right away. But if the beginner is already kind of advanced beginner going to intermediate, then of course the question of purchasing comes up. And then um, usually we have to try violin not only in the shop, because in the shops usually acoustics is like in a bathroom. You know, a lot of times there are high ceilings, uh, the walls are kind of bare, and it all sounds good. It all sounds great. So you need to try violin not only in that space, but also in some kind of dead space where things are not as reverberated. So, again, you take it somewhere where it's a little bit, but also big room. You need to absolutely hear it in a big room or maybe little holes or how the violin projects the sound, if that is higher level, like intermediate level. As I said, for beginner, don't worry too much. Just get a decent instrument. Uh, Luther might suggest one and take somebody with you who is a good, better playing. Uh, first, well, advanced students, yes. Uh, if, if you're the teacher, absolutely try to get involved. I, I'm usually involved with my students. I help them to buy instruments. Uh, and they usually get them on trial. They bring it to here, to University of North Texas, where I teach. And we do all kinds of trials. And uh, we always, well, I, I teach professionally oriented students, right? Performance. So we always try them in the hall. And several instruments in the hall, we try them. And we don't know which one and so on. It's, it's very interesting, actually. OK, so let's go to the next question. Suzuki method uh, is also very good as well for beginners, uh, for beginners, in my experience. Yeah, Suzuki method, I, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a well-known method, all right? So uh, I would not use it on a very beginner, as I say in my Suzuki videos, two videos that I did, book one, book two. Uh, Suzuki moves quite fast. 
uh, in terms of string crossings. And so it stresses things out a bit too much. So yeah, you absolutely, if you study Suzuki uh, or teach Suzuki, you absolutely have to supplement it with uh, actual real violin books, not just going all by Suzuki. Can I ask about multiple string crossings, especially the 16 notes under legato? I've been playing accolade for months right now. Okay, uh, multiple string crossings, 16 notes under legato. Uh, could you please write exactly what the difficulty is? Because there are several different things that can be there. So if you could describe for me what exactly you have difficulty with, I, I can answer better, okay? Um, I have problem with flexibility of the fingers of the right hand on up and down bow. Can you show a way to do all that piece? Uh, I would imagine, I mean, I would, have you watched the videos here on the channel? I would imagine you did, because I'm actually much faster. I have several videos on the right hand. Um, the ones uh, I would basically show right now was were in my uh, bow hand bits and pieces, part one, part two, and I think part three even there's there. So flexibility of the fingers on the right hand uh, comes from the fact that we just don't shouldn't grab. That's one thing. So the the, the one thing to to learn first is to put the bow, you know, here the bow parallel to the bridge. Right, we can see that it's. Not like this, not like that, but parallel, correct? Right? So that's good. That's important. I would put it somewhere close to the uh, balance point or under the balance point. And at that point, just, you know, be able to check all the fingers like this. So basically, all of them have to be completely relaxed and you have to have that feel of balance. So then if I imitate the movement up bow, if I were to go up bow, this is what my hand will do. See, this is the beginning of up bow. And my fingers, you see how they slightly all slide Okay, so, and then if I go down bow, and I will go back my uh, starting point, and I go down bow, this will be, I will start pulling the bow down, which will mean that the wrist will uh, yield right away, and so this is, will be the moment. And so that's very human move, movement, human hand movement, you can do it without the bow, like this. You know, don't droop it completely, but just like, you know, half, half position, uh, or you can start from here, I suppose. You can start from uh, straight, straight wrist, right? So then from straight wrist, I would draw the ball, what I think is up, which is really left here, and then right, left, and right. And that's a, any, any, anybody's uh, hand will do it. And so the fingers are just not, not, not grabbing. If they're not grabbing, they will be doing this. So that's the flexibility. It's actually, yeah, it's there anyway. It's there to begin with. And then we grab and then it stops. Okay. So that I would suggest let go of those fingers. Um, okay. California. Hello. What are some, wait a second. Where did I go? Some uh, practice methods for getting scales and third in thirds to faster speeds. Can they blame slow? Oh, well, I mean, it's okay. So methods, uh, you mean some techniques, right? Well, if you want to do your uh, double stops faster, you know, let's say, okay, so here's G major. You know, if you can do it in this, uh, in this speed, right? And you want to speed it up. So there are two things that you need to do. First, you need to spe speed up in one position, movements of the uh, pairs. to this position. So basically it's a double trill. It's a slow trill, but it's a double trill with both fingers and very light. And first you start it on press and you get can do it without without the bow. You know, just to see like this. Okay. So that's number one. Now but two problem with speeding up thirds is that you need to fast uh, shift fast. So So basically doing kind of things like that. So it's in a way like a burst, you know, so you can also do what I just showed right now, fingers separately. And at first you can do fingers separately without having the other ones on. So that's just the fast shift and then the same thing here. 
Okay, so then you do them together. Okay, so that would be, and then of course the same would be here. All right, so you just do this little bursts of speed and you don't try to play them all faster because that basically stresses up the brain that is not ready yet. So that would be my preparatory exercise to speeding up thirds. How do you prepare for concerts? <laughs> for like recitals? Um, what do you mean? That's a very big question how you prepare, how anybody prepares for concerts. First, you learn the music, you schedule a performance, right? Or you learn the music or you learn the music, then you schedule a performance, that's important. Um, and then you learn the music, or do you mean right before the concert on the day of the concert or month before? So if you please clarify, I will gladly answer. I have been seriously sick. Oh my goodness, I'm very sorry. I haven't played three weeks and want to be back in the shape. Quick effect of the technical proficiency. If this was you, which plan would you create? Routines, exercises? Um... Well, first of all, I would uh, quickly, to get quickly back when you're kind of weaker uh, here in, in, in your body, you cannot stress the body too much. So you need to practice more with your brain because um, with your brain, it means what? You see, all the techniques that we have, it's actually, they're coming from the brain to our fingers. We think that's because we practice here, here it goes up, but it's actually the other way around. So knowing that you can start practicing in your mind, and I mean physical practicing in your mind, okay? So not just like, okay, this is the music I need to learn or whatever. Yeah, but actually with your movements. So if uh, you, when playing, I would do small at first, short times. If I'm really weak, maybe five minutes break, another five minutes, again, break and five minutes break, and maybe like three times a day depending on how weak you are. Um, if it's a bit better, you know, to go for 10 minutes and to do it several times during one day, hopefully, then you can increase it in terms of physical playing. But in between those playing, physical playing, you can continue doing exactly what you just started. For instance, I would do, um, I warm up usually on chromatic scales. I like chromatic scales, especially if they, uh, well, depending uh, how your hands are, but it's uh, always good. So, and it's always these kind of fingerings that I would use one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, two, one. So, not not the moving like this, not the sliding fingerings, right? But a bit compact. <laughs> For me, this is like the best method to really warm them up, and then I stop. And I let them, my fingers warm up, literally by themselves. Um, some people really like doing immediately good doing scales. I would do scales, scales after I do my sound warm up. Uh, it's hard to do some exercises, exercises like either you like do Shevchik or Shradik, or one of each or some some of which. Uh, that's just mechanical mo motion, which is good. Even the movements, um, I would do some of it. Not anything for too long. That's the thing after you haven't played for a while. Uh, arpeggios, go to arpeggios rather soon, um, maybe on the third, fourth day, uh, maybe second, second day if you feel stronger. Arpeggios, then I would go, I personally would go to parts of the pieces that I played a lot and I know very well and uh, I have very good feel for them. I would go and repeat the parts of those pieces usually wakes up everything much better, much quicker than going and learning something new, you know. So I hope that answers your question. But three weeks, usually it's three weeks is not, not a bad thing at all. I mean, one time I didn't play for a year. Well, that was a challenge to get back. <laughs> um, okay, Michelle, my teacher has requested, I order a few chef check books. One of them is shifting the position. How would you recommend working on a stable, flexible hand frame as you ship up the positions on one string string. You know, uh, stable hand frame or flexible, think a bit, if you can try to think about this a bit easier, you know, what is hand frame? Hand frame is basically like this. You want to your hand to, to be in the most natural position unless you get into higher positions when we always are like that. 
we have to get around the body of the violin, so we always get into this position, our thumb is back, correct? But when we're in lower positions, like first, second, third, right, in fourth even, we're pretty much straight in here, and that's that's the hand frame. So when you shift, it kind of just goes like this. So you, we're shifting with forearm primarily. So if your hand is slightly goes up like this, uh, being relaxed, flexible, it's perfectly fine. Just don't go too much. And the same thing on the way back. Don't go there with, you know, but just it, this you can see right now, it's a bit just, it's, it's very relaxed. So when I have fingers down, of course, it's not going to be that relaxed because there's, there's a pressure going through the tendons, right, the muscles. So, and so when you shift, so the main thing is, you know, uh, make sure that even if you have the books of shift recorded, that you still do do your basic shifts, maybe as a warm up. So not just getting distracted by more notes that Shevchuk offers, which is really good. That's very useful. But the basic shifts are still shifts from one, one finger to another finger, and the very basic shifts are only four. So first finger, second finger, third finger, fourth finger, that's it. So if you do a little bit of warm-up, so yes, I'm moving that way, and it stays the same way. It, 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 it's not stressed, and uh, I definitely don't want to press too much on any finger. And when you move, the finger should not depress the string at all, because we're doing it for uh, technical purposes, right? So if you're moving, um, shifting technically, we release the finger. At the moment of the shift, the finger is not pressing the string down almost at all. Uh, so, yeah, I would do preparation like this. Do you have some advice for teaching hand balance to younger or intermediate students? I'm thinking of maintaining intonation without tension on the fourth, uh, fourth passages of Barbara Concerto for the moment. In the fourths. Okay, I see. Um, Balance, hand balance. Well, you know, yes, I guess, but to everybody. I mean, again, this is in my videos, please, if you haven't watched those. I mean, I uh, I assume my callers today, today, so to speak, you have seen my videos. So, but again, sometimes it's just, even to me, I mean, I go and, well, oh, I, I did cover that already, you know, it helps. So, there is this very important issue. The thumb of the left hand should be always not far back. So depending on where the thumb naturally is positioned on the person's hand, you know, like this is my relaxed hand, right? Or this is my relaxed hand, the right hand, which I don't use for playing violin. So here's my thumb, that's where my thumb is. So if I were to do this with my right hand violin playing, so I would put this first finger slightly back. That's the premise, the original premise of playing. So we put the first finger slightly back, and then the thumb is basically against the second finger. Is the same thing should be here. The thumb is against the second finger. So if that is there to begin with, then you know. So and I'm showing that in this in the left hand setup. You know, uh, when I and, and a left hand hand frame, I think also probably. So the problem for most people is that the thumb is placed or moves too far back. And then there will be problems, of course. But if the thumb is left where it naturally wants to be, and that the first finger is slightly back uh, to begin with, so in other words, if I press, I press, I won't go like this. I will go here, and that would be my note in tune, right? So then there shouldn't be a problem with uh, hand balancing later, because the hand then is balanced. Second finger is the middle, like second finger is the middle of the hand. So. It has to be feeling as a middle from the very beginning. You know, beginner students, intermediate students, advanced students, all, every, all of us. So first finger goes back and then the, the three and four are uh, going slightly up, okay? So shouldn't be a problem, honestly. Um, intonation without tension, yeah. Well, there's another question also of intonation without tension. That is a question of um, proprioceptors, proprioception. But perhaps maybe I shouldn't be going on about proprioception right now, unless you want me to, and then please write it down. Okay, the next one. Okay, was there a network problem? 
Um, let's see. Um, somehow it doesn't move. I don't see new. I don't see new messages by themselves coming up here. Oh, here. Okay, just a second. Let me read what you guys wrote. Chords. Oh my God. There's so many things, and it just doesn't. Doesn't mean okay. Uh, so string crossings, there would be string even string crossings. So uh, uh, smooth and string crossings and maintaining the same value. Please or, or pr practice on open strings. So if you have. <laughs> So basically what you're looking in here for is the left elbow level. Make sure that your right elbow is very evenly going down if uh, go down or up. So usually it's when the elbow, elbow moves uh, unevenly, that's when the value of the note is clipped on some in middle string usually. Or you go too far from upper string or too far too 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 soon from upper string immediately uh, too soon, yeah, rushing off to start the passage if it's the first note, but mostly it's the middle notes that are uneven, correct? So that's, uh, it's the elbow level. I would go by that mostly. Um, Portugal, I uh, practicing vibrato for the first minutes to start with your video about, no, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Do you have some advice on left hand thumb standing too high? Um, it's usually the thumb being high is because the violin is low, low in the hands, right? It's either one or the other. Sometimes it's because the thumb is very long. So if your thumb is like my thumb is very long, actually, the length of my thumb is long. So mine would be higher than some other people. So for instance, if it's like this, it's perfectly fine as long as, well, and even that is fine for a lot of people who play without support. So by itself, it's not a problem to have th thumb higher. It's not at all a problem unless it impedes your movement here. So if it impedes the movement, then you need to put your hand just lower, just like this, and get used to different sensation and use that sensation, really. I mean, easier said than done, I know, but that's pretty much what it is. Um, I've also been interested in tension more generally long pieces without breaks, such as first movement of the fifth cello yet I often cramp up at the second moment. Yeah, well, that is the question of being able to play without extra tension everywhere. Like whenever you start a piece. So if your tension builds up, it means that you constantly hold what, I, what we call residual tension. So in other words, if I'm like this right now, and that is perfectly relaxed, and I put my fingers right now, and they're all, you know, relax this they should be but now they're not uh, can you really see a huge difference only if i show like this you can see the difference if i don't if i just start with a certain um with a certain position you won't be able to tell whether i clench sound or not and it doesn't have to be a lot of clenching it just be a little bit but if that never lets go as you play a little bit of that stays well it builds up and by the end of your movement yeah, your hand will be completely clenched. It'll be really hard to play. So yes, you have to start on a basic level, your scale, your exercises, your real like slow agent, and every finger has to go like it, you know, made of, we say in Russia, boiled spaghetti, you know, that sensation of finger, no bones, you know, that's how loose it should be really. So only like that, you can really learn that uh, not to not to have the residual tension everywhere. And every time you take the finger off, it has to go to moments of complete let go, complete let go. Do you have advices for playing like uh, playing like chords on the violin, like putting every string on every string a finger or using double stops? Uh, chords on the violin, yeah. You know, you first you do the double stops, then you use chords yes and you know, sometimes you play all you we rarely put all fingers at the same time on the chord but sometimes we do of course so but if i have a four note chord for instance so i usually will put then the other one so i'm not exactly understanding the question how to maintain bow contact point without looking good point it's actually important um, at, some people have to look at the bows much longer than some others. 
but practicing with a mirror is a good idea. So basically, any 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 way. At first, everybody looks. Okay, everybody has to watch the ball because without it, we cannot quite learn how to do it. So if you look in the mirror, which right now will be, for instance, a camera for me. So then you will just. When I do this and I see that it's parallel, I go inward with my sensation and I just register how I move. And then I will not look and I repeat exactly the same thing. Then I look again and I see if it held up or I record myself. I like video now that we have phones, we have smartphone, recording yourself, checking if it holds. So you can still do the same thing looking here, but feeling how it goes, then you close your eyes and you repeat the same thing, okay? So it's, it's a very important thing, by the way, to learn to play by feel and sound, and not only by looking. Uh, okay. So network problem, has it been solved? The, I, I, I'm fine. I'm alone here talking to myself. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for relieving uh, tension in the left shoulder? Uh, shoulder rest, a uh, person has a shoulder rest, but I find my shoulder gets uh, tense and shrugs upwards, and especially with brain energy strain. Yeah, it's a common problem for us. It's a very common problem. So we, you know, even though I play with shoulder rest, but I, I very often... Uh, teach some lessons to my students to play without shoulder rest so that they will feel that this has to be a help rather than a crutch. You know, that's the biggest thing. So, but what happens, by the way, with either, it can be happened with shoulder rest or without shoulder rest. We want that violin, we feel that that violin has to be secure in, in, in here. They just like stay there and don't move. And so for that, a lot of us do that business with i call it cradling you know when this upper upper shoulder goes in especially if something is not very comfortable so for instance for me i found the combination between my shin rest and the, my shoulder rest which is a wolf uh, i use wolf for the for the secondo but it's also curved to get you know comfortable for me uh, again not for everybody it will be that most comfortable uh, shoulder rest and not everybody would benefit exactly with this chin rest but the combination is the most important for comfort however the comfort for me is that when i need to then i can just let go but it's not that you know it it, it should be kind of movable, you know, it should not be cl clenched there. And I think part of getting tense, it means security. We want security, like violin doesn't move. So because we move our hand and we move this one and just like one of them should not move. Unfortunately, that's not how it really is, how it should be. It all should be movable. So in other words, when you, when I play, and sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm sure I will raise the shoulder a little bit, but then I will make sure I drop it and just it relaxes. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's go to can't vibrato with first finger. Do not press less pressure, less pressure. That's one thing about the first finger, especially. Um, Tips or techniques for practice as a beginner? Well, that will be my videos. <laughs> Please, just, it's all in my videos. Yeah, I, I, I believe, I, I, yeah, I cover it there. Accidentally hitting the rib of violin with my right hand when I'm at the frog, um, is it normal? Yes, it is normal. It's not very desirable. So therefore, you know, if you, it, it's just a matter of control and, and, and how close you come to uh, the deck here. Uh, so, you know, there are there, there bow protectors or bout protectors, I think they're called. They're great things. They're like the, they're putting it in here. It's a rubber thing, black. And then you will learn. Then you don't have to worry about this, but you still learn, of course, not to hit that either. And, and you develop control not to hit it. Um, let's see. Let me go uh, just a second. Um, okay, next one, uh, Opus 21 from reading String Course and Clean, that's uh, the third series, uh, which isn't good, how to fix it. I have, I do, I do uh, cover this in my video. It's called String Crossings. 
very thoroughly. Please watch it of the three levels of uh, uh, three levels of every string and practice them. And that's well, really your problem. Elbow relationship to the bow and also what happens with the wrist and the bow stick. That's how you fix it. Um, professor, uh, thank you so much for your compliment. Violist, how to improve my thirds? Well, again, I think I covered the thirds, how to speed them up. You know, improving thirds is to practice. Uh, let me table the question for a little bit, okay? Okay, and I'll, 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 I'll get back to it. Um, just a second. How do you teach a new student to relieve tension? Do you have exercises? Uh, yes, I was just talking about this, so I think it should be helpful. Uh, how to mention tension to help collect so the student, the student has to think about this, and you have to remind the student in the lesson many times so that they can learn the process. Um, proprioception. Uh, okay, I see that people do want proprioception. Just a second. So, proprioception and thirds. Um, okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, proprioception. Proprioception is the way of muscles to feel like it, it's a concept, it's a physiological concept, not violin, it just has to do with just body. So it is how we feel where a part of our body is in space. Okay, so I would suggest uh, you would look proprioception, uh, here is written correctly, the spelling. And I would just look it up, honestly, because it will be easier if you uh, see a definition yourself. So um, the way it relates to us, uh, to playing, for instance, instrument violin. So a lot of times we use a little bit of tension uh, when we, for instance, oh, by the way, it also goes to the question of somebody asking how you do you teach a new student or the beginning student not to have tension, right? Some beginners will have tension because their proprioceptors don't work as optimally, optimally as they should. And it can be a very gifted beginner, by the way, it can be a very gifted player. It doesn't matter. It's just the matter of the first exercise or not exercise, just to assess little kids, for instance, how we assess proprioception of kids. So we say, close your eyes, uh, take your hand and go, you know, with the tip of your like, say, second finger, you go and you touch your nose with cl eyes closed. So you don't help with the eyes to locate your part, the part of the body you tell yourself to touch. So people with very good proprioception of feeling the muscles in the space will do it without any problems. Uh, they sometimes assess people after strokes uh, usually that is completely off after a person had a stroke. It's also a lot of times is often little kids because they're still finding themselves in space, right? So with violin, we have to have such detail, such tiny movements in our fingers. They all make a huge difference, you know? So a lot of times, uh, especially in the beginning, we don't have a very good feel for like, where am I? Where is my finger? How it touches me? So we use, to, we use a little bit of, uh, uh, a little tension. Then we suddenly feel it better. So our brain then locates our hand or our finger in space much better because there's a little bit of tension. So there's a constant kind of wire going on, imagine like this. And so then you place the finger and you have it, let's say, in tune, more in tune. The, you, the movement is more precise. So the way to train it, I believe, is to, not I believe, I, I know. <laughs> the way to train it without this extra tension is first do it whichever way. If it has to be a bit, a bit of tension, do it with tension several times. Then repeat the same thing with letting go of everything, doing completely without tension and memorizing that. Okay, so, but yes, I just learned that relatively recently myself that it is actually a problem has nothing to do with just violin playing. It has to do with just proprioceptory muscle, or proprioceptory perceptions, I guess, uh, um, of, of the body, of the different uh, muscles of the body, especially small muscles. So very interesting stuff. Um, so let's see, uh, with first finger, I lose precision. Well, you know, somebody asks uh, about precision of your first finger, the side of the head. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's strange. Just again, look at the Goody Menuhin, how he played. He never even touched there to begin with, and he could do it. It means we can do it too. 
It's practicing in that way, way and developing the sense of it. Um, so, let's see. Trouble reaching uh, higher notes, especially on the lower strings like C sharp or D, that then doesn't easily reach far enough. Well, yeah, if you, um, again, depends on when, uh, how old you were when you first started playing. So maybe if somebody starts later, it's maybe harder to go there. It's, it's an un, 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 uh, unusual movement. So I would do it without violin. You need to bring your arm forward like this. And if I do too much, yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable and it pulls. And so basically it means that it's uh, some uh, pull, uh, tight muscle somewhere in the back it could be. So, but in general, we don't need that much at all. We just need pretty much this is the extent that what you maybe a little bit more. But yeah, there is this moment. So if you are a an adult and you've never done it as a child, uh, when for children, that's not a problem at all. So then you just, if you use the moment, of course, it stays, right? So if you're an adult and you didn't use the moment, maybe you know even worth to one time see a physical therapist and see if everything is okay with the uh, back muscles uh, or tightness in there. And that could be released and that will be fine. So basically you need to go here. For instance, that, that is the maximum. I'm, I'm going higher just because you will go here. So yeah, that's the maximum of going there. So if, if that is not possible, somehow it doesn't work, I would consult physical therapist. Tips for tiredness at the... Oops. Just a second. Uh, I lost my place. Tiredness in the left arm after extensive practice. Well, yeah, if <laughs> if you practice for a long time, I always take breaks, okay? Please, just always take breaks. Short uh, breaks, uh, you know, they used to be like, oh, you have to practice one hour, then take a break. Oh, no. Do we ever play a piece that lasts one hour without a break? Never. You know, the longest piece without a break is uh, uh, Chacon, uh, Bach Chacon, so 15 minutes. That's the most. But even 15 minutes, yeah, it's taxing. That's why we always uh, practice for endurance for Bach Chacon to play it, right? So I would, uh, would uh, practice short things, stop, have a little move, move your shoulders, do a little bit of stretching, corner stretch, and go back. And it should be taking care of the problem, unless you also have a lot of tension, residual tension, then work on that so that you don't get that tired. Um, yeah, with this kind of technique, you should be okay, really extensive practice. And you basically, you build muscle again when you practice, you build muscle. So um, if something is too taxing, look into some muscles, maybe you need to develop them outside of the violin as well. So, and then do exercises outside of the violin. We all have to have very strong backs, for instance. We have to do exercises for the back in order to support everything else. So that may, may, may be something maybe that is lacking in your routine. I don't know. So improvisation can be a way of practicing. Um, improvisation would be a way of practicing improvisation. Yes, it's not, I, I imagine it's, uh, well, of course, if you do improvisation and you practice improvisation, If uh, but it's not, I wouldn't necessarily involve it in the physical movement, like technique. Improvisation probably wouldn't be very helpful. You need more structure there, but improvisation is a great thing, so please use it. Uh, what is the ideal placement of the thumb for vibrato? Kogan would place the thumb almost underneath the neck, yes, but Ferrari would ar was around it. It's just what comfortable for each violinist. Absolutely, Michelle, it's what's comfortable for each violinist and even the same violinist can do different things in different uh, portion pieces or depending on how long you have played and speaking about, you know, have you any feel of fatigue anywhere. So, for instance, in lower positions, I would, uh, I, I usually, not always, usually will have my thumb somewhat back like this if I am in lower position of the operating. So normally my thumb is here for brado, it will go here. Yes, it will go more underneath. And as I said before, if you were here earlier, um, if you are playing without shoulder rest, and Kogan basically played without shoulder rest at first, but he always actually supported with a with a shoulder pad or you know underneath the 
jacket. So basically he had support and yet he didn't. So whichever way it is, he would, um, in order to provide maximum um, motion uh, on the side of the first finger, of course, it should be. So yes, that's why we would go underneath a lot of times. But can it be done the same thing even without the shoulders and, um, you know, having the thumb here? Yeah, you can do it. If that means that you will, the violin will most likely be resting in the uh, first joint. You know, or first joint, joint there, and second joint. You can also see how um, uh, Proven does it, you know, when he vibrates. You know, for me, for instance, sometimes when I play Chikosi Concerto, always coming. Whenever I played that theme here uh, in D major, I always was using this. You know, I would, with, with, with shoulder rest actually, right now I showed without, but always, it just was like comfortable there. So for the, that theme, the beginning of the theme, I always would vibrate that way. My, my thumb would be very high and it would be around and not underneath. And then some other places I would immediately go underneath. Okay, so. Um, oh, my old student, Hannah. Okay, I am glad Hannah got you to my videos, Adelaide. Okay, let me see. So um, online. Your video helped me lots in the beginning. Okay, I'm glad you did restart it. So, the proprioception video. I am wondering, didn't I not publish yet the proprioception video? Didn't we not publish yet? Because I had an interview with, with the hand therapist who was showing, showing this. And I will check. Um, um, some advice for chords. Um, oh, I see. All right. So we, you see, we need to publish it, right? We will publish that video. It was actually done a while ago and just kind of sitting, you know, back you know, in the wings. Um, so advice for the chords. Yes. And when, uh, when we are in fifth and sixth, we're touching the body violin with elbow level of, will elbow level of left hand change on all strings. Okay, so I will answer this question. Fifth, fifth or sixth position, I would imagine, right? Uh, with elbow level of the left hand change on all strings, that one, but then I need to about thirds also and something else. <laughs> okay, so fifth position. Oh, let's go. Uh, so if we're in fifth position here and I'm playing... Yeah, so here I am touching the body of the violin with this part, right there. That's my place. Not with here, but just the inner side of the thumb. And yes, so in order to reach for the fourth finger on G string, I will be there. On D, it slightly goes away, slightly goes away, slightly goes away. Yeah. And again, sometimes it's if I'm returning to A string, for instance, right away. You know, here I could stay in, in one position. I probably will be sort of like in between A and E already rather than A and E. But yeah, my body knows exactly. My my arm knows. This is A, this is E. You know, this is D, this is G. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, sixth position will be the same way. So a little bit, it moves a little bit, yes. But much, um, much less than in... Uh, lower positions because of course we're higher and we're in that weird turn so it moves less um okay so advice for chords it's a yes i do um advices for chords but again it's a very general question right now so left hand right hand usually chords are more problematic in the right hand actually because when we do chords we already know the double stop technique we should first double steps then chords right so, but for the right hand, yes, I get, I have videos how to play chords. So I would refer you to that video because it just, it's all there. Uh, if you have watched it, if you have specific question, then off the video that you maybe don't understand, please, please, that's what I'm here for, okay. Um, okay, so then again, somebody uh, asked me about violist, about how to, um, I guess, start thirds or practice thirds. 
uh, the very beginning of thirds on any uh, violin or viola instrument. We usually start with playing like open string and getting to the third, which in this case will be that will be the first third with open string. So since it's A, it's F sharp and A. So the next possible third will be most likely we're in G major here. So it will be. So what we usually do in the beginning, uh, there trot melodious uh, double stops. I believe um, the book is called by Josephine Trot. Very good book. Uh, also, there, there are very many beginning double stops, just double stop in general. Specifically, thirds will be. That's already also fixes intonation. So you put the one finger, the perfect fourth. And then third, you put your third finger, right? So it's very clean. Then you do it together. You fall together. At first, slow tempo. Tempo. I will slur both notes. Same thing. Everything a little faster. So maybe not like this right away. You, it's the very beginning, probably you know, a couple of days, several days, then you will get to that speed. And then you go to the next one. So you have this third note. So first you get the, again, perfect fourth. Then you find your fourth finger there. Um, like that and then so that is to be done in every position no shifts yet so next one will be here pairs of strings you do this you develop the sense of thirds then you go to the difficult part which is how to shift be between them but again if your shifts in general are good then you are going to just do a double shift so one shift is from that's the second finger and then here it will be four to three They're really executed simultaneously, that's all. Okay, so that's beginning of thirds. Um, beginning of thirds or to improve your thirds. Again, the question here was how to improve my thirds. Again, I mean, do you mean speed? Do you mean that's kind of takes care of beginning and the cleanliness and then the speed because you just go faster. And I did talk about the speed earlier also. All right, am I missing any other questions? Uh, please let me know if I am. Just write them back again because there's some, uh, I think, skips. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, it's very late. Good night. Yes, I understand you're different time zone. Um, exercises to avoid this using a, the part of the finger pad that's very, very close to the nail. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, right. So, it's important to not put fingers too much like this. So if we put them, sometimes in, in English, they call them tabletops. If we put them as a tabletop like this, it's not a good idea. And many people teach that way. I'm not sure exactly why, but the, it should be, the finger should be on the pad, uh, on the tip of the pad, of course, but not there. So you see it's a curvature. So basically the more virtuosic people are, uh, the kind of flatter their hand will be. You can see this on just uh, videos of many virtuosos. So it's not this way, it's that way. Now it gets that way, for instance, if I have a short fourth, which I do, and a very long second, which I do, then in, in my case on thirds, yes, I will end up with my second finger being like this. So if I had a very long nail, I mean, your nails are clipped very short. That's very important. So uh, I 
constantly cut my nails extremely short to, you know, at some point it even hurt because I pushed the nail down, but it, it stays down after a while. Uh, that helps, but bare, basically most of the time we don't play double stops. Most of we play single stops, and then there you need to see if you put your finger more in this position rather than in this position, and that's how you avoid placing it too, too close. Um, and a very flexible first finger joint. Yeah, you you train to for it to do to stay exactly in the shape you want it to stay. It's very important, actually, yes, because a lot of people's joints wobble, wobble. Mine can wobble very easily if I let them, but I wouldn't let them, you know, like this, for instance. Nope, don't let it. In any position, I will keep this um, supported, that joint, and it's also a matter of uh, physical strength of the finger, which is physical strength of the finger is in your hand and in your forearm. So we need to have stronger hands and forearms and, and keep the shape. Um, what does music professor do over summer? Um, then do you get to practice for my, myself? Yeah, that's now pretty much. Yeah, it's now. I'm actually starting to practice after a year of basically teaching all the time. Of course, when you have a professionally performing career also, which I did earlier, then you practice all throughout the year. Then you just don't have any life. You just practice and, and teach and teach and I would practice, teach and perform. So when you teach mostly, then in summer, um, yeah, well, we have to practice anyway throughout the year. So um, over summers, uh, some people go to teach in summer camps. Sometimes I do too. I will be teaching in a summer camp here now that we have one in Denton. Oh, I'm so happy because I can be here around here and teach my two weeks in the, in the summer camp. But I used to go, of course, I used to teach in Vermont, uh, several different festivals in Vermont, in uh, Canada, in Italy. And so basically, yes, there are places in New York State, I, I took there several times. So yeah, you go and teach in summer festivals, uh, you stay home, you practice, and you do see prospective students. And some, right now, for instance, people ask me for consultations lessons online. So right now I'm able to actually see people on Zoom mostly from different countries and give them private lessons if they desire to have one. Summer, for me right now, is the, the place and time to do it. So how often do you uh, do live streams on, in here? You know, um, once in a while for now, but I am actually thinking of um, going, uh, developing a membership in my on my channel. And if I go on with this idea, I haven't yet uh, researched it enough, but if I go on with this idea, then I will do live streams for the members. I will do live streams often, maybe every two weeks, uh, maybe every week even if I could, but you probably every two weeks, but I have to research it a bit first. Okay, so uh, scroll up as well is another person had a question. Mm, Michelle, what are you saying? Um, ah, fast travel shows. Um, what is my suggestion? Oh, wait a second. Yes, I see. Um, um, what do you come? What do you come across when students enter the music program? What technique, practice elements, etc. Do you notice that students consistently need to work on initially? You know what? It's completely individual completely individual. There's no such thing as everybody comes and I would do the same thing basically what you know, 95%. It's not like that. It's really, really, really individual stuff. Um, but okay, one thing that I probably would do with most people, um, if they're developed enough, and usually of course they are because they come for performance, um, I will have them uh, acquaint, acquaint them with four octave scales rather than just three octaves. Hopefully they have played original three octave scales. If not, they will do it. And we will do also four octave scales with four octave arpeggios all around fingerboard. Um, double stops of every possible uh, strain of double stops in scales. Uh, not many people do them uh, in the previous training. If they do, great, they continue and they enhance them. So those things, yes. Um, but the rest, um, techniques, a lot of people come with problem of grabbing the bow too much. A lot of people come with the problem of having the thumb stuck back there. there so then we redo that hopefully immediately. Um, 
Now there's a question also recommendation of practicing fast trill. Uh, my trill is usually brought another finger. Yeah, there. Yeah. Um, it's very important to develop a trill with finger because those are cleaner, and we do it usually on starting for that. So it's short trill start, and then the, the same with the next finger. Four. Of course, that would also means what that all fingers are free here. That's very important. So if, if you're vibrating with a trill, it's possible that your all fingers, maybe, I don't know, but maybe they're kind of what I call glued together. If they're glued together, you you, you cannot really even train that technique. If, if you have that situation going on, it's not going to help. You have first to figure out how to not have tension in between like this and just let your hand be in a natural position, which everybody's hand is before we start coping with tension and then doing this kind of uh, short, short short trill in other words you you train short trill uh, to be fast and it's kind of moving i call it the butterfly you know it's that kind of movement it's basically like a, a you know tremor a little bit you know but then it's with one finger tremor okay on any any hand okay so let me scroll down now um, how would you break up in a one-hour practice session? What topics of critical areas are playing or would you work on? Well, it depends where what, what your goals are at this point, at that point when, uh, for instance, right now, if uh, right now I'm kind of restarting again to practice really uh, for myself, not for just my students' lessons and so on, but just for my own purposes, right? So uh, uh, one hour, I would break it first. I will do some about warm up for me, just physically to be warm. Uh, that usually is you know, five minutes. Uh, then I will do certain exercises. I will do dexterity acceleration. So to feel comfortable with certain passages that I do or exercises that I will do. Uh, again, little break. I, I will work on double stops. I will work on arpeggios. I will play either arpeggios in, in a, uh, from a certain note, or I will go to one of the agents of caprices that utilize arpeggios and I work there. Uh, that already is intonation work. So these days I got into exploring a, a tuner, a specific tuner that I really, at this point cannot yet give you a certain um, uh, advice on this, but I'm starting to explore, explore it and I find it interesting and somewhat useful or maybe very useful, we'll see in several days. So uh, then I will do some of this, and then I go and learn my uh, more of the pieces that I want to learn, just the different materials. So I would um, have another 10 minutes on a certain things. Maybe I'm memorizing uh, some several lines in this particular piece and the concerto that I'm looking at, or um, I'm repeating something that I played before and I just want to make sure that everything stays there. And that will be an hour, yeah. Do you ever watch other violinists performing on YouTube? Uh, yes, sometimes, of course, I do. Um, usually for a specific purpose. Uh, I honestly kind of don't have time to just watch them, but yeah, specific purpose, I sometimes do. Um, uh, do Don and Rod uh, Road etudes have to be covered? I would say yes. I would say yes. Uh, if not covered before conservator, how would you suggest adding them in coordination repertoire in pieces as Professor Nkilevich advice? Well, you you know, in our training that in, in, in Moscow or Russia, whatever, it was everywhere in Russia, pretty, pretty much, not just in Moscow. Um, we would, uh, at the same time, you play your scales, your arpeggios and the double steps every day, at least portions of them for sure. And then you have usually two different uh, etudes, contrast techniques, uh, and then your piece of concerto and whatever else. So if you're under, under guidance of the teacher, it's easier because they just demand that you bring them in and show your progress. If you're by yourself, it's harder, but basically that's what I would suggest to do. I would take one of Rod and uh, one of Don. You don't need to cover all of them, you know. I played, honestly, for myself, I did play almost all Don. Almost. I didn't play all 24. I played probably 20 out of 24 of Don. And Rod, I played probably 
maybe 12 out of 24. Some people do, some teachers are the other ways. They will cover the whole road, uh, all 24. And then maybe some of don't. It's it's okay. It's it's just like, it's, it's a little bit different. You learn that this person's technique was this way and this person's technique is that way. That's why it's, it's good to do. Also, another one is Gavigny. I don't know if you have done Gavigny, Gavigny but they're extremely useful, extremely very hard to face as well. So yes, I, yes, I will I will do them concurrently or whatever else I want you to do. Just find the time to at least do you know, a portion every day. Um spiccato and look at the mirror. The mirror I see if my voice parallel, I see it is a little bit crooked. Well um I'm sorry. <laughs> So make a little adjustment, see that it stays. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a little bit crooked. Maybe if it doesn't affect the sound, sometimes some violins will, uh, you know, be, be okay with that, but some violins will sound fuzzy right away. So yeah, it's better to find out what you need to slightly adjust. Sometimes it's really tiny movement. Um, could you tell us again about the music library that can be downloaded for, yeah, thank you. Arsenti, you already put it there. What are the biggest misconceptions, bad practices in today's violin teaching, in your opinion? Oh, there are a few. Yeah, misconceptions, bad practice in today's violin teaching. Well, one of them, I still, I, I don't know how many people still teach with the thumb being there. It's really bad practice. So the thumb should never be um, back, you know, there. So it's a, for the left hand. Bad practice is um, when a lot, a lot of teachers do uh, give too difficult, uh, difficult pieces. Uh, okay, I rephrase. Many teachers rush their students into pieces or concerti, whatever, uh, into material that is way too difficult for the students current level. Uh, many teachers do not cover etudes and they just give their students only pieces. Um, and that again puts a strain. So basically people play with more tension uh, than necessary. Some tension of course is necessary in a way, not maybe the tension, but it's a working thing. I mean, we have, we use our muscles. We, we are certain position that's already tension there, right? Work. So that is fine, but not extra. But when you are given something that is too hard, too soon, um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty bad practice. And it's around, I can see it everywhere. Um, uh, shift, shifting is not covered properly. There is no, a lot of times, not of course with everybody, there are wonderful teachers out there. But uh, a lot of times I see people who never covered shifts. And a lot of times they come from Suzuki methods, actually. I'm not saying that the method is at fault. I'm saying that uh, whoever teaches using Suzuki books uh, should also pay attention to all kinds of mechanics and a lot of times people don't for some reason I don't know why but they don't so that creates spastic shifts like this and they sound accentuated and it's just like the intonation suffers so that um, well and then of course I have my own pet peeve of uh, teaching Kole for a different purpose than it should be taught um, and uh, some people, uh, well, and again, you know, vibrato, how people teach vibrato, or they don't, they don't teach vibrato, like vibrate, and then people have a lot of tension again. So I'm basically having a, I hear myself saying tension, how to do less tension, that should be every, every teacher's goal, I think, but many people don't think about this, so. When a student, um, wait a second, where did it go? Just a second. Um, when a student has learned the piece wrong, technique, how do you correct those problems as a teacher? If I found you, if you found out you made a similar mistake, how would you relearn? You know, that's an excellent question and it's really hard to do, do as it depends on how well you learned or learned in something that was incorrect. Some sounds, if somebody found that piece for a long, long time, the only way to relearn it is to drop the piece and not play it for a long, long time. And when you come back to it, if you have to come back to it, luckily we have a lot of repertoire. Maybe you don't need to come back, come back to it, depending who you are and what you need to do. Um, but uh, yes, I would, uh, when my students come in and they have problems, uh, like really ingrained problems, 
I first thing I do, I always remove them from those pieces. We start anew with a new technique and then absolutely new repertoire because all of this old stuff is really hard to relearn. It's possible, of course, that will require a lot of focus, a lot of concentration, a lot of undoing, like the, the, the fingers want to do this and you said, nope, you're going to move like this and you do it very slowly. It requires a lot of slow focus practice, it requires a lot of brain work, which most people are not even trained to do brain work, you know. So yes, it's hard. It's very hard, but it's possible. And so I have done it myself uh, on, on several pieces. I had to do it. What I had to do in, uh, again, after a long period of time, I wouldn't play them. And then, well, of course, I would say there was a couple of pieces that I played when I was very young, and then I had to come back and perform them with orchestra, let's say. Um, and I noticed, yeah, certain things wanted to surface, even though I was a totally different player by that time. So when they did surface, I thought through them, I went slower and so on. And sometimes I just changed fingerings. If it's left hand, hand, change fingerings. Uh, in what ways do I just need to be used in coordination repertoire? How should we decide which to cover uh, musical purposes? Musical purposes, not sure if you need the musical purpose, you can use it in already in your uh, pieces. That's yes, musical purposes. Um, but learn, usually etudes are done for learning uh, it's a kind of constructive. We usually get etudes, we think, constructive things, which means mostly technical, with some musical ideas, of course. But music is kind of subservient. Okay, maybe not subservient, but it's less prominent in many etudes, okay? especially if the etude is very metaphoric. I mean, yeah, you do come crescendo, diminuendo somewhere, but ma mainly you're working on your uh, dexterity, let's say, in the left hand, or the string crossings, or whatever. So you just attend to those factors. So um, I would say that uh, depending on the repertoire, Joseph, what you're playing, uh, you feel that something is kind of hard, I will go and find an etude that highlights that type of technique and take that etude so that you will practice the same thing only in a different environment, in a different context. That's what's mostly helpful. Um, Okay, is there a specific progression of etudes or studies you recommend to beginners and early intermed and intermediate players? Yes, um, there is. And also, you know what, there are some web, uh, some things on, on the web, some people have yeah, them, I should already. already. Some good teachers can write to it. And Bethany, if you really want it, you can always email me. You know, any of you can email me. The email connected to my channel is violinclassusa at gmail.com. And so I'll, I'll be able to answer more specifically there. Misha uh, Skripach. If you're still there, yes, you're well, very welcome. Yeah, which I'd rather still actually. Um, okay, what was the third dated book I mentioned? So I mentioned Kaiser, I mentioned Wolfert, and then it went to Mostras. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, Mazas. Mazas, Wolfert, Kaiser, Kaiser, Wolfert, and Mazas. Mazas is higher level, will be. Um, and then, of course, Josephine Trott. Uh, they, uh, and then look at Dankla. Dankla may have uh, some really nice things, but those are in the methods. You know, sometimes you have to look at methods and just see and choose good things from the methods itself, like one-liners usually there will be. Uh, what do you, I recommend for coordination? Um, that's a big question. I recommend for coordination, main thing is not to work not to make things happen because that's what ruins coordination coordination lives in the brain some people have better way with this and some some not so you probably know which one you are you are so you coordinate it there you first think of the movement or movements and then you literally coordinate them so you can do them without tension that's the main thing okay uh, memorizing etudes is the end goal of an etude to play like a concert piece. Some etudes are hard to memorize. Yes, the end goal for us, the those who were trained in Russia, we always had to perform them by memory. Yes. Um, do I always uh, insist that my students, all of them, learn it by memory? Depends. Some are, have harder time and they have too much repertoire going on, and I might allow them to perform it with music, but you pretty much know the, the etude by memory, even if you use music for security. But you have to know it that way, because, I mean, you have to know everything that way, because that's how technique works. Technique is memory. Technique is sits in your memory. 
if you don't have it all memorized, including the con connection, the consec consecutive notes, right, which is the text, then you, you don't really have the technique yet. So anyways, so memorizing it as well, you use, you use all kinds of methods there. I mean, um, a lot of the Kreutzer, Vyampolsky iteration, those are patterns a lot of times. They're just patterns. You have to kind of name them for yourself and just sometimes visual, visual has to be involved because some etudes, yes, they are uh, less uh, melodic and you have to just break them down into something that you can hold in your memory. It's a kind of big question, so I would leave it at this. And if you have more questions, you can contact me separately. Um, watching tape without audio, the best way to monitor attention. I noticed perhaps because of the mirror that can be distracting from focusing on musical material. Um, tape without audio. I don't know. I've never done it, actually. Um, Practicing constantly, well, constantly practice with a mirror. No, you can't. You shouldn't. The inter, uh, mirror is an intermittent judge. You, you can position yourself in around the mirror. You play, and you know you look, and then you immediately you go in, as I said, and then you repeat without looking there. You know, absolutely, constantly have to translate. Mirror is only helping you uh, to translate what is good, what is correct, correct into your physical memory and audio memory. Um, um, how could be really be really be really be really really for others? You know, that is actually not a silly question at all. Depends to which degree your hands are sweating. It, it means that you're nervous. Uh, but you know, there are some people who are nervous to such an extent, but they don't feel necessarily even nervous. And I had a student like that who would get such sweaty hands. I've never seen any other sweaty hands like that in my whole life. Uh, was a phenomenal player, fantastic player. But sweated like I, as I said, I never saw it before or after. Uh, sweat would literally just run down and everything would be wet. His fingerboard wet, his bow completely like wet. <laughs> and... Um, he, he couldn't do anything with this. So and he wasn't feeling nervous either, but it was definitely a sign of nervousness because when he was playing by himself, it wasn't happening. So a nervous system sort of just did it for him without him feeling bad. So uh, we tried several methods. There's a, if your hands are not so sweaty, then the good thing is to do right before you go to public, you um, take a, uh, alcohol wipes. Just plain alcohol wipes, no, no, not, nothing, no, no smell in there, and so you just, just wipe your hands, and so they become drier, and so for a while it will help, and hopefully your level of uh, anxiety in a way, you know, nervousness, this will go down as you play, and nothing will happen. It will be so for some people it's extremely helpful, but for somebody like him, ah, no, it would be pouring anyway. So. Um, for him, the only thing was to get used to the fact that it will always be like that. So he performed a lot. I put him to perform every week. He performed twice in front of people every week for a whole year. Yeah, he just he, the same sweaty hands, but he was more comfortable with them. Um, do you recommend daily practice or is it okay to take a day off each day or two off each week should it just based on well you know if you're a professional violinist and if you are you know performing you will never do that yeah if you're an amateur well probably you know i would daily daily practice as usual yeah if you're serious yeah daily practice well you can sometimes skip one day but yeah it's better not to so I am also a former student of Ditto. Oh, really? Wow. And I love watching your videos with Megina Rada and Daughter. Oh, Diana, I'm so glad. Maybe you should write to me. Write to me. To, me. to the Violin Class USA, gmail.com. I will be very, very happy to talk to you actually about Dinaki Gregorina. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> Misha not a spot. Sorry, that's for Misha Skripach. That's we are Russian speakers here. Okay, so um, now last question so far that I see is Yordanova's primer. Uh, she mentions not touching the neck with the side of the first finger hand. How do you feel this is about basic technique? 
you know what um i it's possible as i said before i i play myself i was taught to touch here but you know Migu Di Menuhin played without touching. Augustin Hedelich of the current violinists plays without touching. So uh, obviously it's possible and perhaps it only in matter of how you start. And if you start without touching here and, and just develop like this, it might be just fine like those two wonderful violinists are. Uh, most, most violinists actually do touch here. So I'm, I feel fine. I mean, you can always go Back to touching, actually. I, I, would, I don't think it's fine. Um, do you teach the viola? No, I don't. I asked my teacher if there are adult violin camps like for kids, and he says that there are. How do you rate them? How do are they usually set up, and what level should one get? Um, adult violin camps, definitely there are. Yeah, I know that there are. I, I know one friend of mine is teaching um, in in one of those camps. Usually, people are quite good players there, uh, so they're usually played before, maybe in childhood, and it's less than seriously. I think most people, but maybe not all, actually. I'm sure not all, but most people. Yeah, they played and then they stopped and they went into different careers and they just love music, love to play, and so they go to those adult camps. I cannot rate them. Um, I cannot read them because I honestly don't know how many they are. I know they used to have one at Interlock and I used to teach at Interlock and Arts Camp. Uh, well, I taught in Interlock and Arts Academy and Arts Camp. But during the camp season, so in summer, that was also, I think at the end of it, there used to be a, a adult uh, camp for adults in chamber music. Most of those camps are for chamber music. So there is another one in... Uh, California, for sure. That's where a friend of mine is teaching. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, now Joseph is asking more. Uh, is the order of concertos being covered different for each violin? Is that a certain one is, one is, is there and you're covered before the concerto? Is piano skill irreplaceable to learn sonatas and concerto? I would say yes. Uh, piano is very important. Uh, we do need to know how piano works and play piano, at least on some level. Absolutely. That's very important. Um, and uh, whole harmony thinking is through usually through the piano. It's much easier. Um, order of concerto being uh, different for each violin. No, there should be some. We don't have that much repertoire written for violin as, for instance, pianists do. So there are certain concertos that have to be covered. If you want to you know harmonious development, yes, they have to be covered before you go to conservatory for sure, or just in order to, you know, there is a method, there, there are different methodics maybe, but they're kind of similar. So I have my Russian kind of a, a Russian Soviet, which is really based on Franco Belgian, but it still was Russian Soviet, Yankelevich um, and Yampolsky, so Yankelevich studied with Yampolsky. Uh, and so that uh, sequence, there is a sequence of what you give approximately what you give after, after what, you know. So yes, you should really one uh, for more successful development of the violin is the one should play a lot, a lot of um, uh, pieces and concerti written by violinists for violinists, and not jump into non-violin concerti too early. Barrio concerti need to be done. Uh, for younger people, Dankla needs to be done. It's wonderful and it's great build up. Dankla variations of, there are several levels of variations of Dankla. Beautiful music too, by the way. Um, but it is in addition to Akali, in addition to Hollander, in addition to, of course, Vivaldi before that. Uh, but then, yes, uh, Road, Barrio, um, Kreutzer has lots of concerti. A VOT, absolutely, and uh, Spor, Ludwig Spor, have to be done. Um, YouTube membership, I am just working, thinking about it. Yes, thank you, Arsenti. We're going to let know what we think about this eventually. Uh, for an adult who played at an intermediate level, what method book? Oh, let me see, it's jumping. 
uh, recommend and what uh, topics should they cover during practice and how long should daily practice be? Daily practice uh, really depends. If you're an adult and you're doing it in your spare time, basically, you have to go kind of in a different way, I think. Uh, well, not less than an hour. An hour you will have to spend with the instrument for sure, thinking and playing and thinking and playing and evaluating and playing. So that's the minimum, I would say. No less than an hour for sure. But, but after that, it depends on how much time you have and what goals you have. So between an hour to three hours, if you have that time, great. If you don't, you can do uh, two hours and you will progress still if you if you put goals, uh, correct goals, and you achieve those goals during practice. That is, uh, we're actually thinking of making another maybe stream or some kind of video uh, with Arsenti Karitonov, who is my everything outside of what you just see here. He is my director, producer, and so on, and uh, all kinds of help, and my partner. So um, we are thinking of actually making uh, either stream or a video on practice, on deliberate practicing, and what it is and how to, how to have it, because that's the only way to practice, really. So there, it will be very clear, it's not by hours, by what you do within every minute, with it, within every five minutes. And that's the most important thing. But all things considered, yes, about an hour is a minimum you will spend at the instrument, working uh, towards the instrument, with the instrument, and, and in your head. Uh, question. In your left-hand video, you said that uh, place uh, two, three, four finger and then create space between the side of index finger and neck. How do you do this? Twisting your wrist clockwise or just shifting to our hand. Uh, so place two, three, four, and between the side. So basically, I don't remember exactly what I was saying there. I, I was also going through this, through the Milstein. I call it the Milstein position after my video called Milstein exercise. So here, that can be done through there. You know, so that's where the placement will be. Uh, let me see again. How do you do that? Create space between side of index, finger, and neck. Yeah. So what you don't want to do, you don't want to do putting the three and then putting the first finger like this. So that's what I'm advising against, right? So you need to make sure that this part here is straight. So just like it is here, it's straight. So you can start with the first finger, just don't press, and then arrange fingers, and then you need to turn your forearm here slightly to turn the fourth, tiny for turn for, to accommodate the fourth finger. So it's not a good idea to twist your hand to accommodate the fourth finger, by the way. So, but yeah, there, if I say two, three, four, what's the better method for violin beginner, four-year-old? Ooh, Fortunato, you mean? Fortunatov. I'm not sure about Fortunatova method. I've never seen that one, but there was a Fortunatov uh, Russian method, um, which is, he was a, comp I believe Fortunatov it, uh, is a com compilation of, of uh, progression. Um, yeah, four, four year old, four year old. Um, so I, I would imagine if you know Fortunato, if you probably are, are a Russian speaker, if you're a Russian speaker, then there are really, really good books in the beginning, Russian books, and they, you can uh, get some of them through ruslania.com website. Again, if you want more, uh, write to me to, as I said, the email, uh, email from this channel is violinclassusa at gmail.com, and I will... Uh, steer you in the right direction. Um, do you think going to the gym can have a positive effect on the body, in body awareness and posture? Well, body awareness, I'm not so sure, but it absolutely is a good effect on the posture, yes, because, I mean, going to the gym, doing correct exercises correctly, make sure that your posture is good there, um, then yes, yes, because we, we need to have a good, you know, strong back and good posture here in order to deal with all of that violin throws at us, you know, which is asymmetrical and that tension still creeps up and so on. Yes, going to the gym is great. 
body awareness maybe too maybe yeah maybe it will also help swimming is great for violin for we we say because it's a little less stressful i guess but it's also really like good for muscles especially those who recover from um, any kind of um, um, traumas physical traumas um all right thank you in case a talented player who doesn't lack technique but didn't have enough age to the concerto uh beauty yes being covered before conservative what do you suggest well again it depends on what that person plays right now already what they can do right now sometimes i have people who didn't do any of those good concerti but they are you know pretty good and if i don't see like real gaps in their playing maybe i wouldn't put them back onto you know some of those concerti they don't might not need them anymore because they somehow managed to arrive here but for most people there are gaps and so and so for those gaps i will go for a specific concerti that i know that that will address the gaps best so so uh, Spore number two, first moment of Spore number two, I will do, or, so so that's easier one. They're double stopped and things like that, and a lot of shifting, which is very good. Um, I would do VOT number 22. I would do Spore uh, number seven or number nine, at least one of them. Seven is, I would take it a bit more um, advanced than number nine. Not eight at this point. Eight is much harder, actually, Spore. So nine or seven. Um... Bear you, you know, if the person hasn't really got a sense of a good solid double stopping and just kind of all kinds of things, I would bear you number seven is really good. Uh, bear number nine, mo most people know, and it's a very good concerto. But again, if somebody's playing Bruch, um, or you know, maybe they don't need bear you number nine, but maybe they still would benefit from number seven. I need to see that person honestly, I can't just uh. It's a kind of diagnose. You can't diagnose a patient without seeing a patient, right? Um, so, okay. So, how how to motivate the students and make them do the exercises? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> I usually don't. I mean, my motivation is, well, I work with old, older people. So if you're local, I mean, with, with college students mostly, and those under college level that come to study with me, if they do, and if I have time, uh, they usually are motivated. Yeah, just So, but the younger kids, um, be inventive. With my, my with the older students, I tell them, okay, you have a choice. If uh, you come to a lesson and you sound like nothing moved, so I would I can assume that you're not talented, just not gifted enough. You're probably practicing, but nothing moves. That means that you lack ability or you lack talent, or you're not practicing. In in any case, your lesson is not going to be pleasant. What do you what do you choose? Usually, they start practicing. So, but they're older people. They're like. 17 and up. Um, that sounds amazing. You too. Yes, thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, have you seen Asian mom, an Asian mom, uh, two set violin practice video? Four hours long, helps to practice a lot. Ah, you know, no, I haven't. I, four hour long video? Oh my gosh. That I should only watch if I, if I cannot sleep at night at all, I guess. Well, thank you. I'll. I'll look at it. I haven't seen it. Um, so, all right, thank you. Curious if you've read that what every violinist needs to know about the body by Jennifer Johnson. If so, have you ever recommended to students? You know, I think I know Jennifer Johnson herself, but I don't think I read that particular book. Um, she would have written it after I have already known it. Um, no, I haven't. I probably yeah, should look into it. I, there are lots of very good books on uh, body awareness, uh, practice techniques, uh, and, and so on. So thank you for yeah, uh, I will look into it. What is your my opinion of Leopold Auer method? Um, it has to be taken... Um, I would not recommend it as a pure method. Um, 
but I mean, it's okay. I mean, if you if you like it, if you like it for yourself, I wouldn't I wouldn't teach by that method exactly like this, even though the principles, of course, are good. But Leo Boldauer, honestly, my opinion about this, uh, the far as far as I know, what I know about Leo Boldauer is his teaching, which of course I would actually in any way you do. You know, I've been studied with him and uh, terrific violin was started with him. But let's not forget that those people uh, came to him while they were already good players. They were very advanced players or super advanced players already before they came to our. So our, our did not really teach them techniques. He, did, he taught them music, how to approach music, how to be in music and so on. So of course it involved some levels of technique, but not how to start. You see what I mean? They never started those people. So, but then he went to United States and he uh, encountered students who were weak or not playing at all. And so that's when he started thinking about his method, how to, to do. And so, you know, many things there, of course, are wonderful, but it's also very dry. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't take everything like at the face value what he does, but I like the fact that he starts with open strings here and hopefully their left hand can be done in pizzicato separate hands. That's important. Uh, but later on, it's, it's a bit um, yeah, tedious. Maybe not as interesting. There are like better things to include. Um, for ages, you mentioned uh, and Mazas. I know some say Kaiser do, don't say thirty-seven. Then onto Kreuzer. Kreuzer. Um, I would say before Kreuzer, Mazas has to be done before Kreuzer. Absolutely, absolutely. It's unavoidable. You know, don't open thirty-seven is a lot of the Don't Opus 37 is, is equal to Kreutzer. I mean, Kreutzer is a very uneven book, honestly. I mean, it's a great book, of course. We all love Kreutzer. But the point is, it's an uneven book. It's a very easy age. It's a very beginning, like about four or five of them. Very easy, extra easy. And then, bam, it, it jumps here, and then it, it goes up even higher, also pretty much jumping. Has a lot of very difficult and good etudes for trills in Kreutzer, and so on. So, and it's very dry. Also, Kreutzer primarily dry material. So you have, I mean, don't is much more melodic and much more interesting. I think for, I mean, this was for me for sure when I was little. Uh, the thirty-seven. So I would do thirty-seven of don't already together with some of the Kreutzer. So it doesn't. I don't see it as necessarily a preparation. Yes, it's preparation for later Kreutzer. But not to start Kreutzer. You can start number two and three or whatever, four or five, be, together with that Don 37. But uh, Mazas has to be done. Mazas is great agents, absolutely wonderful. Um, how does the teacher develop their curriculum? Well, my, I'm lucky I didn't have to really develop my curriculum. I inherited it because the curriculum was by year, years and years and years of uh, methodology in Russia, in Soviet Russia. It was fantastic. So I have all of that just like here in front of me. You know. um, but for other teachers, if they don't have access to this, they cannot find an access, you know, they have to develop it by themselves. Just knowing a lot of repertoire, going and trying and, and seeing and analyzing and so on. Um, I know each teacher is different, but I know the ages get more mixed up after Kaiser. What skills and teachers looking to develop the muscles? Well, I mean, again, it's just the techniques. Yeah. yeah, that's where you get into the teacher thing, you know, whether they understand like what this student needs. This technique comes after that technique. Don't jump to this technique before you cover that technique. That's exactly the experience. That's what's always so great, great about the Russian methodology because it was all tried before and best things were kind of put in progression. And even there, my teacher still, like I would have a book of etudes that will have, or did have rather, uh, here's Kaiser, here's some burial that is nowhere to be found for us. You know, here I can find that volume of burial that they used from which they took the so certain little edits from his uh, violin method actually. So that's from some other name that I don't even know other, other than this particular uh, etude, never saw that name in my life before, but it will be right there in this uh, progression in that etude book that I would have, would have like for first and second grades at school. Okay, so somebody already went and they did it and many people played it 
And even so, my teacher still would say, okay, so we'll do this number one. Okay, we do number two now. Let's keep number four. Mm, no, let's go do number six. Do number six. Then we return to number four because she determined that for me, it's better to do number six first than to go to number four. Even though the progression in that etude book pretty much could already be done just like in the order of these etudes, just like the way they are. You know, it's very individual. So, speaking of teaching methods, um, do you have an opinion of Evgeny Gordon's music learning theory? No, don't know. I have to look at it. Do you have a favorite violinist <laughs> who inspired you to play? Yeah, well, I don't have one favorite violinist anymore, but who inspired me to play was definitely my mother. My mother was a fabulous violinist and she practiced all the time and she had one of the best violin tone of sound, you know, in the, in the universe pretty much. And I was very, very fortunate to grow up next to that sound in another room practicing. So yes, she was definitely the one. If not for her, I wouldn't be playing violin. Um, but then I really loved Heifetz when I was little. Uh, listened to Heifetz uh, long LP, right, long play recording. When I was little, it was uh, uh, "On the Wings of Song" by Mendelssohn, and then also Mendelssohn concerto, also Heifetz. Then I grew up, and I when I really, really grew up, I realized, ah, no, I really don't like. <laughs> <laughs> the way he plays Mendelssohn. But when I was five, I was listening to it all the time. Later, I loved Stern, Isaac Stern. He was my favorite for some time. Um, but, you know, it's like several months. Then you go to another one, a great one. We, in our household, we adored Chrysler. Chrysler was our official, you know, official icon in my house was Chrysler. Fritz Chrysler. Um, interestingly, Professor Grishenko considers Don't first as a secret need for poor technique. Yes, of course. I mean, it's, uh, Grishenko, yeah, Grishenko, of course. Yeah, it is. Um, it's very, it's very good. That opus thirty-five, correct? Yeah, thirty-five already. That, that was, I was talking about thirty-seven. Um, um, there are many myth conceptions about the concerto being learned before. And Damage and damaging by excluding musical maturity. Mm. Mm. Well, no, I don't think it damages anything. I mean, you don't need to play a concerti necessarily um, to develop musical maturity. You can play pieces, you can study music, you most know, symphonic music, um, opera. You don't play them, you listen to them, you give a, develop a lot of musical maturity that way. So, no, it's not necessarily, I don't think it before another Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, but any, I don't exactly understand here. So you played one of them, let's say Tchaikovsky, and then before Sibelius, you should play something else or not? Not sure, but I would say technically uh, in, in Russian school of thought, we played more virtuosic concerti first before going to Tchaikovsky or Sibelius. So uh, Paganini would be played before Tchaikovsky or Sibelius. Paganini is musically not, you don't need that, that much maturity for that, <laughs> honestly. It's, it's great music, but it's very simple. Uh, thank you, Arsinti Zori Shekhmurzaeva. That's my mother, yes. Speaking of Chrysler, I cannot wait until I am able his... Oh, Caprice Vigneur. So you mean the big one or the, the not the small one, but the bigger, bigger one, right? Yeah, one day. So... Uh, Hello, 30-year-old guitarist and just got my violin a month ago. Amazing that they can call both of these things, I mean, string probably, right? String instruments. <laughs> it is true. That's very different. Okay, so now let's see. Did I miss any, have I missed any questions? I hope not because it's about the time that I need to, to taper it off and go on. Let's see. I hope I mentioned an answer to everybody. We are still 37 of you, 39 of you. Now, okay, so if you have, anybody has one last question, please, your chance. Uh, you're very welcome, Michelle. 
Uh, and again, if you want, if you have uh, specific questions, I um, will welcome your email at violinclassusa at gmail.com. So, and Joseph at the end says, I've heard stories that many virtuosos of violins from Moscow played Vinyaski before concert. Of course, yes, that's true. Yes. Yeah, we were, we were, when, when we, we went that way. That's true. So, uh, well, will be the next live. I don't know yet. Uh, you're very welcome, everybody. And I will see you next time. All right. All right.